Okay. I think we're live. Um, so welcome everybody to the third event of the South Indian SDR user group. Uh, today is uh, Saturday, April 30th, and uh, we're very excited to have our third event here. Um, I think there's an echo. Um, so, so yeah, thank you for joining. Um, this event will be recorded and uh, we'll be posting it on our website after the event completes. We're very excited. We've had a bit of a change of plans uh, at the last minute, but we uh, have two speakers tonight and we're very excited to have them. Um, a couple of announcements first from the community uh, as we get started. I'll mention that um, the New England Workshop for Software Defined Radio, New SDR, will be will be starting on uh, Friday, June 3, and that is a virtual event. Um, and the, the, the New SDR event has been going for 11 years, and uh, there's a lot of exciting speakers and uh, um, other, other networking opportunities at the New SDR event. It's all virtual and it's free to join, so just wanted to let everybody know about that. And there's also the GNU Radio Conference, which has been announced. Um, the GNU Radio Conference will be held in Washington on September 26th to 30th, that whole week. Uh, that's a physical event. I think they are live streaming some of the talks, but uh, if you're able to make it, it certainly is a, uh, a great experience to go physically to the conference. So I just wanted to, to make a few quick announcements there. Um, I'll introduce um, our, our uh, South Indian user group. Um, we were founded in January of 2021, and we are a community of people ranging from novices to experts, people spanning industry, academia, and government, who are interested in the design and implementation of software-defined radio technology and systems. This includes such diverse areas as RF, dig digital signal processing, wireless communications, operating systems, computer networking, software development, and machine learning and radio hardware. The mission of our community is to facilitate the exchange of ideas and enable greater collaboration within the SDR community in India. We host regular technical workshops and gatherings, and we run a dedicated Slack workspace for the community. We have a YouTube channel for recordings of past events. We have a GitHub page for any relevant code from the talks. And we have a Twitter feed, which contains announcements for upcoming events and other news that's relevant to the community. We are not focused or tied to any one single software tool or hardware platform or commercial vendor or specific technology. The SISDRUG is a nonprofit organization and the people organ on the organizing committee are all volunteers. Most of us are based in Bangalore, but we invite people from all throughout India as well from outside of India throughout the world to join our community. Please reach us by Slack or by email if you have any questions and want to connect with us. And with that, I'll introduce the organizing committee and I'll ask each member to just maybe say hello and we'll just start going down the list. Uh, this is Aditya Aran Kumar. So I was previously working in electronics for fun. I'm currently a signal processing engineer. That's all. Okay, thanks. Next. Hey, uh, hello everyone. My name is Apar. Uh, thank you for all our speakers, Thomas and Yashodhan, for uh, speaking at our event. And thanks for the live audience to you know, tune in for this event. Um, hope you have a good time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next. Okay, thanks. I guess next is me. I'm Neil Pandia. I'm actually not based in India. I'm based in Austin, Texas in the United States. Um, I'm a, a SDR application engineer and a group manager at Edis Research and National Instruments. Um, yeah, thank you for joining tonight. And I wanna give a special thanks to our speakers for taking the time to attend this event and, uh, and, and contribute their presentations. Okay, next. Uh, hi, I'm Rohan. So my interests are currently in real-time uh, object detection and image processing, but I also have a deep interest in signal processing and SDR. Okay, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Aditya Kumar, who will introduce our speakers for this uh, for today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Neil. So as Mr. Neil mentioned, there has been a couple of changes in our schedule. 
So due to some uh, last minute time changes, a couple of speakers had a drop off. And I'm really thankful for the speakers who are joining today, Mr. Parry and um, Mr. Yashodhan Vivek. And here's a short bio on the Today's topic for Mr. Parry is open silicon radio design for satellite uh, for satellite communication. Mr. Parry is a mixed signal IC designer working at Systematic Design based in Delft, Netherlands. His work has taken the uh, his work involves taking designs from consumer idea conception to product validation. He's a key proponent of open source community led initiative and is a contributor to phase four amateur radio project which aims at deploying modern amateur radio satellite into geostationary orbit and beyond. He's worked in a wide range of customer in, in multinational semiconductor companies and a number of early stage startups. He, he basically bridges the gap between an uh, analog and digital and is comfortable in RTL and high performance designing layer. Mr. Parry is also an enthusiastic supporter of Skywater 130 130 nanometer project and is attempting to design world's first truly open source amateur radio transceiver IC. So that's Mr. Parry. The next uh, speaker would be Yashodhan Vivek. So Mr. Yashodhan Vivek Manke is uh, currently IoT security and compliance manager at Piato in Pune. He has developed a lot of IoT industrial products and AI capabilities for research and has experience in signal processing, RF and electromagnetic. He's also currently, uh, uh, he also has a vast amount of experience in cube satellite. Currently his work is on for research focusing in side channel attacks and fault injection systems. And those are our two speakers for today. Thank you for uh, joining us in this presentation. We can now begin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Aditya. So we'll turn uh, things over to our first speaker now, uh, Mr. Thomas Perry, and we'll we'll have him begin. Okay, great. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, uh, can you see that? I assume you can. Yes, thank you. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on in the um, open source silicon community. So project titled, um, a talk titled Talking to Satellites with Open Silicon. Um, so the goal of the project basically is to design the first truly open source satellite um, radio transceiver. So traditionally, semiconductors have been very secretive and it's been almost or well, has been impossible to do anything truly open source because the fab we actually get the semiconductor um, created or manufactured basically has a lot of information that you need to, to create your design so these are like uh, simulation models of the devices or rules of how far how close you can place um, metals and all these little details that you need to be able to make an actual design um, and yeah, this has basically all been hidden behind NDAs or non-disclosure agreements. So it's not possible for people to share um, these designs openly on the internet or in any other way. And that's been a real shame because obviously the world's moving more towards an open source framework. Um, what's been achieved in software, with Linux, um, the web, um, so many good examples of very really powerful technology improvements with open source. And that's not been possible in semiconductors. So about, I think, a, about a year and a half ago, the first open source semiconductor or um, yeah, semiconductor PDK or process design kit, which has all those details that I mentioned, um, was open sourced by the fab Skywater in the US. And this was sponsored by Google. Um, and they, they're basically helping this um, to try and encourage more open source silicon to happen. Um, basically, they also think that it should be possible to design open source or design silicon and basically share designs uh, amongst engineers and amongst the world. So they're trying to make this happen. So they also funded um, basically some production runs. So they use a technique called um, multi-project wafer. So it's typically the, the most expensive part of making a chip is making the masks. So to make an actual chip, you start with a bare piece of uh, silicon wafer, and you basically go through many processes to, 
to build up the, the chip layer by layer. So start off um, basically placing doping into different regions of the chip to make different P and N um, regions of semiconductors. And then you can make contacts up to higher levels, um, make oxides for, for gates, um, there are different layers of, of metal and, and uh, via interconnects. And so typically you'd maybe in this kind of skywatch process, you might have 35 different masks. Um, and that's really the expensive part. So for maybe a 130 nanometer process, which is what Skywatcher is, it's probably somewhere in the region of 60 to 100,000 um, US dollars to get those masks made up, which for prototyping is the, the main cost really. So with a multi-project wafer, it's kind of similar to what's been done on PCBs, um, where you put multiple PCBs together into a shuttle run. You put multiple uh, different designs together into a, a mask creation, so you can have lots of different people's designs um, and share the cost of the mask, which makes the unit cost um, lower. So that's good. Um, I mean, it's still quite expensive. If you to do this by yourself, you're probably talking looking at something about 20,000 US dollars to do it, if you just uh, out of your own pocket. But fortunately, Google is paying for, for a number of these runs to try and stimulate the, the community and get things going. So this project basically used the first two um, MPW slots. So two different designs that were taped out. Um, We've got the first silicon back on the first MPW, still waiting for the second one. But um, I'm going to go into more details about that later. So the high level goal of the project is basically to try and make a yeah fully open source amateur radio satellite transceiver. So basically everything from, from the designs to the schematics, to the, the layout, to the actual um, definition of the semiconductor profile, uh, doping profiles, everything for the open source and available on GitHub. Um, so for the project, basically it's targeting the Q, uh, Q0 100 satellite, which is a, I think it's United Emirates, I can't remember which, it's, it's a Middle Eastern um, country's uh, communication satellite, which has an amateur radio payload on board. Um, and that has an uplink at I think 2.4 gigahertz and downlink in a 10 gigahertz band. So the, the goal is basically use that kind of as a target and see if we can make a single chip solution to talk to the satellite. So the one caveat is probably things like uh, power amplifiers would be off chip, but try and get as much as possible on chip. So the kind of system architecture would look something like this. So it's um, see the base right side we've got what would go towards the antennas and then we've got a receive path and a transmit path so the receive path basically would have some amplifiers um mixes um filtering some more mixing more filtering and then digitizing by an agc um and then the transmit path is basically the same thing but in reverse um so digital uh well create analog signals with a dax um, filter up convert um uh, up convert some more filtering and then power amplifying um, and then of course some digital baseband done in kind of digital logic so um, this is also kind of where the, the SDR side comes into play because it's not well it's not SDR because it's really an ASIC it's really actually hardware but much of the the let's say the designs the RTL of Verilog or VHDL designs it can be used in FPGA, can also as easily just be retargeted to put on an ASIC. Um, and then some kind of serial interface to get the data um, on and off the chip. And then some like generate um, reference generators to create kind of housekeeping um, signals and things that you need to basically run the whole chip. So kind of looking at this, high level architecture i haven't created everything yet um created segments of it and basically taped out on the first two shuttles so in the next segment i will basically talk through some of these uh sec sections uh, subsystems and circuits that were designed so created um let's this. created a digital analog converter so the general idea of this is that we can put 
basic digital signals into it and we'll get an analog signal out. So it's 10 bit um, DAC, so we can put 10 bits in. Um, so the topology that was used was the current steering topology. So this is a high speed topology. It's um, not necessarily the most uh, power, yeah, it's not the most lowest power, but it's um, high speed. Obviously there's a trade off between speed and power. Um, so the way this works basically is that there's a number of unit cells. So you can see here the, the unit cells. Um, and we look at this one here as an example. Basically at the top here, we've got a current source. So these basically these two transistors just create a, yeah, a current source. And then here, we've basically got some switches um, that turn the current source on and off. And these cascodes basically, um, well, it tries to prevent uh, voltage noise basically getting the output. So at the highest level, what you can kind of see at this this diagram here, what we're doing is we're switching the current source from either the, the left or the right, or you can say the positive and negative. So you can steer in this current back and forth for a, a bit that's on or off or a zero and one. Um, so to do that in a say a fast way with a high quality signal, you also need to basically drive these bits here at, with the right voltages basically so that you can keep everything biased. So this is what the se the central section here does is it basically takes the input from a digital signal and then maps that um, switching signal into the right voltage domains here to, to switch these FETs and keep everything um, yeah, operating in the right voltage uh, domain in the right uh, region, shall we say. Because when you want things to move fast in semiconductors or, or threats, um, transistors in general, you basically want to keep things biased so that there's always current going through the devices and that's what keeps them fast. So you have to kind of, you don't want to switch things fully on and fully off because basically the recovery time will be too slow and you get bad performance. So this central section here basically is trying to switch these um, steering FETs in such a way to keep them um, biased correctly. And then, so basically you've got 256 of these um, unit cells. So that's basically eight bits of resolution. Um, and then another unit cell, which is half the current. So you can see here we've got two FETs, but here we've only got one. So basically yeah, half the current is going down to here. And then this last one is quarter the current. So where well, you can kind of see that this is two in parallel. And then this is a single one in parallel. This is two in series. So basically one half quarter. Um, so to create a high quality signal in the frequency domain, you basically want to avoid spurs. So any kind of analog, let's say repetitive non idealities that when you pass a periodic signal through will show up as some nonlinear spur, um, which basically rather than having a nice band limited output signal, you're going to have some tones outside of that, which can interfere. So the way to kind of avoid that, because you, when you make this stuff on a chip, there's always going to be variations from each transistor to each transistor. That's unavoidable. What you can do is you can make the transistors bigger to try and average out the differences. Um, another approach you can do is kind of average them out in time. So that's what I've done here. I basically used the scrambler. So rather than each unit bit being associated with the same, um, let's say the same number. So if you, if you imagine you have, if you just look at the eight bit section, you have 256 numbers that can be represented, literally one so zero, one, two, and each time you want to go to the next level up, you just turn on a new, a new unit cell. But if it's this repetitive, um, let's say non-linearity when you turn them on, that will show up in the frequency domain. So instead what you do is you basically use a scrambler to choose a different unit cell every single time. And that randomizes the, the noise essentially, because that's what that is. It's basically noise between the different, um, unit cells. So you break up that noise kind of like a dithering and then you'll get better frequency performance. 
So that's basically what the scrambler does here. So constantly as it runs, it just randomizes which unit cell it chooses. Um, and thermometer coding basically takes from a binary input, so say an 8-bit or well, 10 10-bit input, and then breaks it out into the, the separate units. Um, okay, yeah, so that's kind of the high level of that DAC. So you can see here the unit cell, um, and yeah, so when you design stuff on chips, a key important thing is is basically um, hierarchy and replication. So for each of these unit cells I just mentioned, you basically create a structure like this, um, and then they're just arrayed many times. So you can see here that basically there's some digital control here. So that's basically just like uh, digital gates um, to turn things on and off. Up the top here is the current mirror, which is the current we saw at the top here. And then here's the, the switch, which basically turns the the current one way or the other way. And then they say it's important supporting circuitry here. So yeah, basically each one of these uh, unit cells get um, copied across. So 256 of them, 258 of them, sorry. Um, and then down here is basically a digital section. So this is the scrambler and uh, thermometer coder that I mentioned. So this is basically designed in, in Verilog and then synthesized um, to the gates in the process and then a placing route tool basically puts down the gates um, in the optimal way that it can figure out and then wires them all up. So it's kind of similar to an FPGA when you basically uh, do a synthesis with an FPGA and then a placing route and then wiring. So it's the same idea, but rather than connecting up cells that already exist in the FPGA, you basically place down new cells and new wires. So this is basically a block that came out of the open lane tool, the digital synthesis tool. And then, yeah, I stuck that down, connected it to the analog section here, wired it all up. Um, and that's the, yeah, that's the full DAC with basically current outputs that come at the top. Yeah, so with now a, basically a baseband analog signal, which comes from some kind of digital processing, um, the next stage is some kind of up conversion. So to get this baseband up to an RF signal that we can actually start to transmit over the air, um, use a up converter, which is basically a mixer. But of course, we'll have two DACs um, to make a quadrature output. Um, so we have an end phase and an outer phase, or I guess a Q phase, quaternary phase. Um, so yeah, we'll have these two offset by um, 90 degrees. And then basically what you do is, yeah, you upsample each of them and then combine them in the RF. So the output of the DAC is basically current, as we touched on. Um, and then this basically converts the current to well, a voltage or power even. So here you can see the schematic diagram. Um, so the general idea is that the current comes in from the DAC in here. Um, these devices basically current mirrors, so whatever current comes into here, it's going to be mirrored back out of here, possibly by some uh, factor if you change the size between the two of these. But essentially, the current comes in here, copy that into here, and then similarly here, plus minus, and in this side here for the Q. And then the mixer here basically commutes the, the, the currents, so depending on which way the, the mixer is switching, so positive or negative, basically the current either comes down to this arm or down to this arm. Um, and that's basically how you can get the current from the DAC to appear here, the outputs, but switched back and forth by the, the mixer. And then you can see, of course, the, the inductors here. So that's basically what we use to um, convert the current to a voltage. So the doctor will have a given um, impedance at the frequency of operation, and that basically converts the current to the, to the voltage. Um, the nice thing about the inductor is you can basically use the inductance to cancel out some of the capacitance um, to high frequency design on chips. Basically everything you're bathing against is, is capacitance. Um, because the dimensions are so small and everything is right up against each other, you've just got lots and lots of parasitic capacitance from everything to everything essentially. And that's 
the hardest thing he has to fight against. So one way you can get over capacitance is just to use more current. Um, and the second way is you can use inductance to try and tune out basically the cancel some of the capacitance. So inductors are nice, but you can see here at the layout view that they're very large. So you can't use them. Yeah, you can't use them everywhere you'd like to use them. So here basically you can see that the top metal is the yellow metal and basically there's just a large kind of circular what well, in this case it's squarish but a shape that basically forms around here to create a basically well this is not really an inductor it's, it's a coupled well coupled inductor should we say so at the center here is, is the center tap to the, the voltage um supply voltage which is up here and then you've got one inductor that comes around here and one inductor that comes around here but they're coupled in antiphase, so that basically helps with the circuit because one in the circuit one one polarity is meant to go up and one is meant to go down. Um, and then basically, yeah, if you have a coupled inductor which is coupled in antiphase, then the common mode rejection is better because basically the inductor starts to only encourage currents that go in the opposite ways. So yeah, basically here it's coupled inductor at the top. You can see the kind of the comparison on the circuit. The inductors are quite small, but in the layout, the inductors quite large. And then down here is basically all the um, yeah the FETs. Um, so on this design, there's also just a single pole filter here, just a simple RC filter. Um, that's probably not enough for a real high performance design, but for a quick kind of technology demonstrator, which is what this is. It's going to help um, for probably if we try and go to a much more higher performance design than an actual active filter with a higher order will be needed to basically kind of attenuate the, let's say, the higher, higher frequency noise from the DAC. Um, okay, so to, so what that um, upper motor we're just looking at has a current input from the DAC. And obviously there's the LO inputs here, so the local oscillator that needs to be generated somehow. So yeah, as all modern, um, let's say, radio systems do use, um, I use the, a phase lock loop or start design the phase lock loop. So the idea of the phase lock loop basically is that you can use a low frequency but high accuracy source, like something like a crystal oscillator um, more mem structure, but something that's, that's lower in frequency that you can use you can use to get the, the accuracy and then transfer the accuracy to a higher frequency signal in the megahertz or gigahertz or I guess terahertz theoretically. Um, so the idea here is you basically put in let's say 10 megahertz reference from a crystal oscillator and then this gets compared the phase of this reference and your feedback signal gets compared and that creates an error signal which basically uses a or charge pump some device that converts the error signal into a physical quantity like a voltage or a current in this case a current then there's a filter um in that filter well there's two functions of the filter one is to destabilize the loop so this is a loop so you basically have to use control theory to make sure that the loop's actually stable um and also you want to attenuate a bit of high frequencies and basically the, the frequency shape of the filter will impact the noise the phase noise performance at the output of the oscillator so once you created the error signal and you filtered it you basically feed that to a voltage controlled oscillator or well, it doesn't have to be voltage controlled i guess it could just be a controlled oscillator but in this case it is voltage controlled and that's your output um, and then yet yeah, to complete the loop, you basically take a feedback of the output and put it through a divider. You put it back to your reference. So the divider could be many different forms. The simplest is just an end divider. So you just divide by, let's say two. Um, but often that's not good enough. So I'd say you have like a, a 10 megahertz reference signal. Then if you use an integer divider, you can only get increments of 10 megahertz um, which often isn't good enough. So you, you'd use a fractional 
division ratio here. So you can have a divide around, let's say like 100.36 or something like this, so that you have more accuracy um, on the output frequency. So taking a step lower, it starts to look like this. So this is on the MPW chip that I did, the MPW one, sorry. So the VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator on that chip used the, or basically ring oscillator. So the idea here is you've basically got a number of um, inverters and they're just fed back to each other. So if a signal starts to propagate, it just basically loops round and round and round. And then the way you control the frequency is you use some control signal to, well, in this case, um, change the load. So basically this control signal here changes how the resistance or the impedance of this load and how much current can be sourced into the capacitances in the circuit. Um, so that allows you to change the, the delay, should we say, of each element. And then the frequency or the period is the function delay of each element. Um, so yeah, we have the load here, which we can change with control frequency. And then basically a cross coupled pair here, which is a, a gain element. Um, which amplifies the positive and the negative. So you notice everything is, is differential here. So really you do want um, differential everywhere you, you go, you're trying to make high frequency um, signals or processing on chip. Um, so yeah, ring oscillator to create a voltage controlled oscillator. And then that's an output. Um, so this is the dividers here. So you can see that there's what four so if you divide by four and then further divide by what's that 16 and then divide by four. Um, so because this is going to basically be about 2.4 gigahertz, you need to use a high frequency um, divider. So here's a CML or current mode logic uh, divider. So basically it uses uh, two latches that are interleaved. Um, so these cross coupled pairs form latches with resistive loads. And then of course the a flip-flop is just two latches that are basically chained to each other in antiphase. Um, and that's what these two, so a latch and a latch form essentially a, a flip-flop. It's then um, controlled by the input signals here, differential again. So it's a high frequency flip-flop working as a divider. So that knocks down the frequency by four um, and then let's say small, so this is quite high power and leaves a lot of area on chip. So you don't want to use all the, you don't want to make all of this out of this, this, this topology. So the next um, dividers down use a different topology, more of a digital one. And then the final two use just a standard cell um, straight out of the PDK, which is a standard flip-flop. Um, so yeah, that's going to divide the signal. And then to create the fractional divider, this is done in, it doesn't have to be, but in this case, I did it in, in synthesized logic again. So in RTL, in Verilog, and synthesized with, with open lane, because the frequencies are slow enough now, you can use standard digital um, tools and techniques. So there's just a simple counter, which is yeah, just an up counter. Um, and then that serves as the, the last, integer divider, but then there's also a fractional divider here. So a fractional divider you can do just by, let's say, quantizing, having a integer divider with a, with a fractional section and quantizing. Um, you can do that, but again, you get noise and spur problems. So what we use here is to, to try and get around that is was basically a noise shaping. It's like a sigma delta function. Um, so basically, the, the fractional um, division is put into this the sigma delta or noise shaping mash filter. And what this does is basically takes the quantization noise, which is still there, and pushes it to a higher frequency. Um, and that higher frequency will later get filtered by the, the filter out here. So any noise that's created here will eventually get removed by this filter here. 
Um, so yeah, it's a MASH filter, which is quite common in textbook use for in phase or groups. And then the output of the divided signal is then compared with a phase frequency detector to the reference signal. And so this is basically just uh, an XOR with um, two flip-flops, nothing very exciting about this. And then the charge pump is basically a current source or a current um, sink that puts current in and out of this node. And then externally, there will be a filter um, off chip. So that can be played with. So in MVW1, use this um, ring oscillator, which is, let's say, simpler because it's just uh, some FETs. In MVW2, um, move to a LC um, VCO, which uses a, well, basically inductors and uh, capacitance. So it's more of a resonant filter, or a resonant oscillator. So it allows you to get a lot higher in frequency and the, the phase noise or the, the spectral performance is much better. So this uses a Colpitt's um, topology. So basically, if you just look at one side, um, you kind of see a classic Colpitt's um, oscillator, and then it's doubled and mirrored basically to create a differential oscillator um, with some very actors here to tune the, the oscillator. So you can basically pull this node higher or lower to make the filter oscillate faster or slower. Um, and at the bottom here, there's basically, yeah, more gain. So that, again, you can see here, Doctor is the main area of that Colpitt's oscillator. This time it's used the orthogonal um, inductor. So that will give a slightly better Q so less phase noise and a sharper, um, say, spectral spike in the frequency domain. Um, yeah, so you can see the inductor here, and then you can see here is the capacitors. Um, I think this is the variactors here, um, and then transistors, transistors, um, current source here. So it's actually, relatively simple in the sense there's not that many components in there. It's just the question of actually selecting them and sizing them in such a way that you get best performance. Um, so here you can see the layout of the um, ring oscillator VCO, which was this one here. So you can see the four segments. And here you can, well, you can see the symmetry of, of four sides. Um, so yeah, and the last one I looked, thought was was nice to try and make it as symmetrical as possible. It looks quite nice. Um, and this again is, is another, so this is the the fractional divider um, synthesized out of Verilog into, into digital block by the open lane tools. Um, and then to get the signals off chip, basically use the as simple as I could circuit. So basically two big, um, large FETs that need eight drivers so that we can drive them fast enough. Um, that basically create a differential currents in and out of the, the pads. And then externally, basically using a ballon to um, convert this differential signal into a single ended signal, which then can be connected to a spectrum analyzer or uh, SDR, or whatever we're going to use to to receive the output signal. Um, okay, so all these all these blocks kind of have an assumption that there's biasing. So everything, any circuit you design, you need to bias to make sure it's operating in the right region. So usually that means at least the current. So you basically want like a, let's say like a ten microamp current to to bias everything correctly. And often you also want a voltage. So you want to say I don't know. You need a 0.5 volt um, node for, for doing something. But basically, you need bias and you need to have some reliable on chip um, physical quantities that you can base everything off. So, the standard way of doing that is the, the band gap reference, which I also did here. Um, so, the band gap reference basically is created using a, a PTAT, so a proportional to absolute temperature 
uh, current and the CETA, which is complementary to abs absolute abs complementary to absolute temperature current. So the idea is, if you want a current which over temperature just doesn't change at all, um, you basically get a current that goes up with temperature and a current that goes down with temperature, and sum them. And then if you do it right, this basically it's just flat. So to create a theta voltage, you basically just take a diode. Um, so if you just look at the diode equation and then the thermal voltage of a diode, you basically see that as temperature increases, the voltage across it goes down. Um, and then to create a theta voltage, you can basically take the difference between two diodes, which have a different current density, and that will give you a theta um, voltage. Yeah. So you can basically use these these two theta and theta voltages from the diode relationships and create currents for them. So you see here is the kind of the core section where you have the two. Um, well, here we use PMP devices as diodes um, to get better performance. So this one is a single diode, um, which I'm trying to see if you can see in the layout where that where that is. I think that might be over here. Um, and then you've got eight diodes. So you basically got a higher current density in the single diode than in the eight diodes. Um, and because you have matched the amount of current through them and you use a air amplifier to basically monitor the, the voltage between the single diode and the eight diode plus a resistor. Um, and that resistor basically the voltage drop of the difference between the two diodes will create a current through that resistor and that creates your pita. So essentially you've got this loop here which regulates the current down through this these two diodes. Um and that creates that creates your pita current. Um and then similarly this loop here creates the CTAT current. So once you've got your PTAT and your CTAT current, then you can basically combine them, which is what the output does here. You can see, well, one, you can different options. So it's CTAT output, PTAT output, and a combination. Um, and there's some tunability. So again, everything made on chip. You can have some, let's say, manufacturing tolerance to it. So you want to have some tun tunability to, to be able to make tune things digitally when you get them back. So there's a tuning block here, which is what's that? Six bits um, back essentially of the, you can make the current bigger or smaller. And that means digitally you can basically change the, the temperature profile of the band gap and tune it just correctly. Um, and then, yeah, you can see the circuit there for the op amps which is quite a standard um folded cast code op amp structure it's very textbook um, and then finally there's a beta multiplier reference which is used to generate a reference that starts the whole band gap in the first place so the simulations at the time showed less than 0.2 percent variation across the whole temperature range um, which is pretty good I'm not sure how much I would trust the simulation models because that was just when they first came out. But um, yeah, I think it's it's relatively good. And on the side here, you can see the the layout, which is much more of let's say a low frequency analog layout. Um, so in this case, there's really no high frequencies. You don't want high frequencies. You want to be as stable as possible. So it's more about basically matching structures rather than creating low parasitics. So you can see here that the kind of the uniformity in some of these structures, how you basically, where you basically create an array and you try and match them um, so that everything is, is as balanced as possible and accurate as possible. Um, okay, yeah, that's as much as I have for this presentation. But I thought, depending on how much time we've got, if we have any questions, and then I can also show you some late, some live um, 
walkthrough of the schematic and, and layout is also possible if you're interested. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Mm Hey, Barry, Aditya here. So, have a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, so, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, it, yeah, I'll wait till the end. You know, can wait till the end. Once there's a turn, no issues. I'll wait. You can continue. Then. Sure. I mean, feel free to ask your questions. Um, it might be interesting because then I can. They might be related to things I can show you. If you know what I mean. Um. Usually, when we move to the RF side of things, we talk about matching circuits in between them, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any matching circuits present in the current design as such? Because I was uh, looking into this RC circuit, RC looks like a simple LPF part of things. Are there any current matching circuits, you know, so that there is proper power transfer between your uh, chipset and the front end? Yeah, so I mean, matching is. I'd say matching is not as important on chip. Um, it's a bit debatable as people take have different stances on it. But if you think about this, the kind of the transmission line um, effects where a lot of the matching comes from. Um, yeah, you, you basically when you think about like what tenth of of a, a wavelength. So what's what's the wavelength at three gigahertz? It's basically I think about ten centimeters or something. Okay, okay. But basically, in on what's that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Let's go. Sorry. But essentially, on chip, um, the dimensions so, are so small. So let me actually that at least the frequencies that I'm I'm using um, are so small that the transmission line effects actually don't show up. Um, that's not a universal statement because once you start to to move to higher frequencies. Um, so the millimeter wave, where you start to look at like uh, 60, 100, 200 gigahertz, then the frequency, the transmission line effects do start to come real again on chip. But at least in this case, let me show you. Okay. Another part is uh, you're having a scrambler and a unit cell for switching between your 100 mega samples rate, right? So, um, so, so the mean... scrambler to switching cells, there was some noise uh, things that uh, we had to, you're, you're telling about. Yeah, the same, yeah, uh, yeah, the same thread, the same thread. Can you give a little bit uh, more idea on how the scrambler and the noise on the driver actually works? Because that part was a bit confusing when I was thinking about it. Um, yeah, let me try and think about the best way to describe this um let me see so let's see if, if i do something like this And so this is basically the different values of the output of your DAC, it's like one, zero, one, etc. Um, and you basically have, let's say, a ramp output, then that's ideal case. But 
when you basically make the, the things on chip, there's always going to be a mismatch. So each of each of these different elements is not going to be equal. Some of them will be a little bit more current. Some of them will be a little bit less current. Um, so essentially, you'll end up with how to draw this quickly. But basically, some of these things will be like higher, and some of them will be lower. Um, and you basically don't get a good transfer. And basically, what that means is when you have this um, imperfections in the, the amplitude. Um, so if you just, let's say, you're using like you had a DC DAC, then you basically have an inaccuracy in the output and will depend on the application that might matter, it might not. But what happens when you put like a, a periodic signal, like an RF signal or a still an RF baseband, but still periodic, is that when you go around in your period, you're basically going to hit the same imperfections time and time again. So you basically, you basically make your, you, you these imperfections then create spurs in the output. So rather than just having So you just expect to have one tone like that. Okay. When you've got these imperfections, they'll basically create multiple tones because you basically, when you have, let's say, a sine wave, it's always hitting this imperfection every single period. You basically end up with 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 yeah these tones. Um. And especially in RF applications, as you know, you don't want these tones because they can interfere or they can even mean you can um, fall foul of, of basically the, the transmitting um, masks because you can't have things outside of your band. Um, so you basically don't want these tones and they're, they're inevitable of any inaccuracies in the levels. Those, those level inaccuracies get transformed into a frequency error. So, mm -hmm. okay. So basically, in order to avoid the errors that occurs when this kind of ramping happens, you have a scrambler. So whatever happens is completely sort of randomized in nature, and your frequency is also corrected uh, that way, right? That's my understanding from this diagram. Yeah, exactly. So if you just have the, the static case, you'd always hit the same errors every single time you went around your your period. But what the scrambler does is every time it goes around, it uses the same elements, but it arranges them in a different way. So it just juggles this round. And then the next time it comes around, it's in a different configuration. And it basically it swaps them around and it randomizes it. So you basically take this energy that would be in the spur. And well, in fact, you just, you just basically create it. You just, um, yes, yeah, like did the, you basically take that energy and you randomize it. Okay. So it's still there, but it's spread across more frequencies. Um, and it's yeah, the actually quite interesting design. Philosophy. Yeah, and uh, I have one last question. There was a place mm -hmm. I saw a single pole LPF. Was there any yep. specific uh, decision, you know, for choosing that single pole LPF? Because textbooks tend to use it, but uh, Single pole LPF tends to have some drawbacks when it comes down to the frequency domain, right? Like to have a sharp cut somewhere. So that's why. I was yeah, I mean, it's... so was there any particular design uh, decision between the single pole LPF? No, I mean, so yeah, uh, it's not. It's definitely not the the ideal um, solution, should we say, in terms of performance. So that's that's very true. Um, the reason I used that is because I felt. It would be good to have some filtering and basically it's it's very simple because i can just drop in these r's and c's um so that's basically why it's it's basically better than having no filtering but it's certainly not the the best filter the best solution um yeah that's for sure 
Okay. And uh, one last question regarding this uh, inductors that I'm looking at in the current slide. What is the footprint, approximate footprint size of those inductors? Because you know they look way too big for the layout. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I can show you. Um, so here is the. So basically, actually, if you mention that as well, um, maybe I can show you in the first MPW submission. I think it's this one. Yeah. OK, so this is the whole whole chip. Um, so this kind of section here in the middle is, is the, the user section where people can basically put the designs. But then outside of that, there's this caravel. So basically eFabless that are paid by Google to kind of run the shuttles. They design this. So this outside section basically has the pads. So this is what you see here is basically the pad ring. Okay. So each of these are um, basically the pads where the connection to the outside world is made. So in this case, it's a wafer scale chip package. So there's basically a redistribution layer that basically goes on top of this and routes each of these to a pad, which is essentially like a BGA. Um, in other chips, you might find that there's a, a wire bond. So basically a small wire is, is connected to here and then connected to the connection on the, the pad which goes to the pin but yeah these are basically pads um so these are let's say digital pads with some analog pass through so there's some digital control here they can make them inputs outputs or um tri state or to configure them basically kind of like you would in a mic controller um so yeah basically pads all around Around the outside here. Then down the bottom is a RISC V processor. So this is the Pico RV32. Although I think they've changed now in recent um, recent shuttle submissions to a Rex RISC V. But yeah, so basically a, a RISC V microcontroller to control everything um, and some memory here. This is just SRAM. Is this SRAM or is it? Yeah, it's SRAM. Um, and then there's a flash, um, SBI flash chip um, on PCB with the code for this. So yeah, that's the outside. And then each of the submissions gets this space here. Um, so you can see then this now basically is the, the space. It's just looking at that one level. Um, and then, yes, going to your question. So let's first I put dimensions on the whole chip. I think it's what? So 3.6 millimeters. Um, so everything, all these numbers will be in micrometers. Um, so that's the whole chip, 3.6 wide. User area is about 2.9 millimeters wide. And then, yeah, this inductor is 150 micrometers wide. Um, so yeah, I'm only big compared to the the FETs down here, but, yeah, but it's still quite small. Yeah, that yeah. Would be my cruise is actually a good one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have a question from one of our viewers. So. How was the mm -hmm. yield for MPW1 and MPW2? The yield? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> so MPW1 is near zero, basically. So that's a bit of an unfortunate story. But essentially what happened is that there was a mistake made by eFabless, who they basically designed this section. And their so the place and route tool is open source tool, which is based on the open road open road tool, which was basically funded by DARPA, the US government that 
funded research into the internet and GPS and this kind of stuff. Um, so they funded the research into this open source place and route tool. Um, and then eFabless kind of built on top of that. But there was a problem with the clock tree synthesis. So basically, yeah, when you have your design and you have your different cells, you need to basically come up with a path for the clock to go to all the cells. Um, and it's quite crucial that that's done in the right way. Otherwise, the clocking for the whole chip doesn't work. And yeah, short, long story short, um, that wasn't done correctly. So basically, the whole chip clocking doesn't work well. So there's hold violations. Um, so as you might know, if there's setup violations, you can basically run the chip slower because it basically gives the, the signals more time to reach the flip flops before the clock gets there, so that's fine. But with hold violations, essentially the signal gets to the flip-flop before the clock. Um, so there's nothing you can do. Well, what some people did is they started playing around with the, the voltages um, to change the timing. So one guy in particular, um, his kind of handle is TNT. I think his name's Sylvain. He made quite a cool tool that basically with an FPGA would exhaustively search different um, voltage, basically ramp or change the voltage supply and try and find the location that the chip would work. So you seem to get some good results with that. Um, I haven't tried that yet because it's it's too much work to be honest, I haven't really had the opportunity. So yeah, MPW1 basically doesn't work, which is a real shame. Um, MPW2, they are making the chips as we speak so I'm hopeful that will work. They did spot the issue with MPW1 before completing MPW2 manufacture. So they've fixed that apparently. Um, so we shall, we shall find out with MPW2. All right, yeah. So those are the questions we had. Uh, yeah, you can continue with that. Uh, I have one question here. Uh, from mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, okay, so uh, this is a shared uh, mask, right? So you have multiple uh, designs on the same, I don't know what you call it, caribou. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you told Aditya that you don't need, this, so transmission line effects don't matter in an RF chip, but I'm wondering, like, because of the presence of the other designs, uh, would that affect the performance of your chip in any way? Because, you know, the, there are a number of designs that are next to each other, maybe they're Okay, yep. Yeah. yeah, so you still get the shed mask, but you still only get um, just a single chip back, if that makes sense. Um, so actually, maybe you can see, I've got some here. So I'm not sure how well it's going to work, but these are actually the, yeah, you can't see very well. But yeah, you basically you still only get just the chip back. Um, it's basically diced per chip. So the wafer will have multiple different um, designs on it but then they cut up and separate the different designs. So okay. you basically only get back this segment. Yep. I'm wondering if you did any power analysis uh, in simulation, like some sort of uh, spice and loop type thing to check what the power, uh, how much power this takes, or uh, is that further down the road? Yes, I mean, I did um, some, well, quite a lot of uh, spice uh, simulation um, of the design, yeah. Um, so yeah, most of it's digital, uh, sorry, most of it's analog design. Um, so that's relatively simple in terms of power, especially when it's linear circuits, because you basically, you basically bias the circuit at a given, a given current, um, and your support, your supply voltage is set. So you basically know straight away what your power is going to be. Um, I didn't do any power analysis for the, the digital sections, um, the digital sections were quite small so you can see a little chunk here and yeah a little bit here so yeah no no power analysis for the, those um, i don't think there's really any good open source power analysis tools that i know of um but yeah for the, the analog stuff i did look at that quite, quite a bit yeah uh, thank you all Okay, yeah, so I can show you, like, so this is the, the kind of the top level schematic for. 
Um, so it's basically using a tool called X Scheme, open source tool. I quite like it. Um, for those of you that might have used the Cadence Virtuoso tool, you can see it looks kind of similar. Um, so yeah, basically these are the, the ports here, which eFabless provide, and that's basically maps to the, the output ports that you can kind of see along the side here. So this is, yeah, schematic representation of what this would be if it was empty. And then, yeah, basically create different circuits in here. Um, so that's, what, that's the DAC. So you can see here is separated into a digital section and an analog section. The, the digital section is not got really anything in it because it's in the analog view. I've just got a netlist basically that comes from the digital facing out synthesis tool. Of course, the actual design is in, in Verilog, which um, well, it's not a very exciting design, but you can see it on my GitHub if you, if you are interested. Um, and then the analog, basically, yeah, I mean, it's just the same. I'm sure you've all seen schematics before. You basically have hierarchy and you have cells and you can connect things up. Um, so for example, one of the unit cells um, so yeah, for this case, I basically created an array of these unit cells and it's asking me which one I want to go into. So I just, yeah, the first one's fine. Um, and then basically, yeah, these are the, the individual device transistors that you can instantiate in the design. So this is what essentially would come from the PDK, the process design kit. So you can, um, yeah, so if I was to I'm not sure what it's set up, but yeah, basically you can copy them, move them around and stuff. I mean, obviously it's schematic and then you can change the length and the width of the um, transistor. And I mean, that's really the only thing you can change. You can, well, you can add more either in the form of different number of fingers or you can multiply them. But essentially the only thing you can really change is the length and the width and the number. And yeah, you can basically arrange them into whatever circuit you want to, to make. Um, so that's, yeah, unit cell which matches one of these. Um, and then build it up. Um, see here, basically just a lot of wiring. So it take, takes a bit of time to do all the stuff behind. It's, um, yeah. But, so yeah, create that up and you can see some of the, yeah, this quite a boring one, this space is a test output where it basically takes the, the current from the, the DAC, just mirror it, and pass it to an output pin. RF section maybe something more interesting. So I've got two oscillators which match to these two oscillators here. So one just goes to a buffer and then output driver. And then one goes to a buffer, up converter, buffer, output driver. Let's see. Yep. Um, yeah, what can I say? So yeah, in here you basically got the model for the inductor. You can see you've got an inductor symbol, but if you go down here, you'll find it's actually just a lumped element model. So to create the inductor, I used a tool called Acetic, which is a very old tool, freeware, not open source. Um, I think it was a PhD student project, but basically I used that to design it. It gave me the lumped element model of the inductor, so I can use that in simulations. And then it gives me the dimensions that I can basically draw layout. Yeah, basically, you've seen this before in this presentation. Yeah, so I mean, that's basically the flow. I mean, you, you create your schematic here, you can simulate it in this tool. I'm not sure it will work right now because, yeah, I'm going to try. But yeah, you can basically simulate it in this tool with Netlist simulate waves. You can look at the waveforms. And then once you're happy, you can start drawing them on the layout in K layout. Um, and then you basically run some checks to make sure that your netlist matches your layout. 
and that your design rules are met. So all the spacing and everything is, is correct. And then once that's done, you basically upload it to GitHub, fill in a form on eFileless's page and wait. Well, in my case, about a year and a half, but hopefully I think the newer ones will be faster. And then you get your chips back. So yeah, I mean, I'm happy to dive anything into anything in particular if anyone has any questions or areas of interest. Any other questions? I don't see anything on the live stream. Okay. So I think we can we can probably then end here. Um, I'm pausing and going slowly just to see if any last minute questions come into the channel, but but I don't see any. All right, um, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah, for your talk. That was terrific. Um, that was yeah, really no interesting. Um, yeah, no, thanks for having me. And um, if anyone has any comments or questions, just um, get in touch and yeah, I'll try and answer them. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think your slide contains your, your contact information, GitHub repository, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. super. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for pushing Thank Thanks. You. OK, then. So with that, we'll uh, we'll move to our second speaker for today. And we'll get set up here for the for the video. Okay, and I will turn it over to Mr. Yashwadan Vivek. And sure. you can begin when you're ready. Yeah, yeah. Let me share Thank the presentation. You. Uh, let me know if you can see in the screen. Yes. Okay. So, hello everyone. So, I'll be discussing on basics of this astrophotonics, right? So, it is a kind of introductory type and what is this astrophotonics, what it comes and what is the use of that. This is the agenda that we are going to follow, right? And of course, we'll uh, discuss uh, some of the design concepts that we use in astrophotonics. What are the components that we use in the photonic circuits? And their applications as well. So when we look for astrophotonics, it's it's basically a combination of astronomy and photonics. Now, of course, like space exploration has always been everyone loves to do that, and uh, it has been observed that okay, there are certain challenges in astronomy with in a different fields of astronomy that can be resolved through the photonics, and that's what we're going to address over here. Now, generally, who needs all those uh, astrophotonics? So whether you have a telescope, right, a huge telescope, and you are interested in finding out some of the nice visible sources or some of the galaxies that you want to go deeper into and understand what is the, the patterns, right? So from the astrophysical perspective, you are interested in understanding their uh, spectrums. You have to understand their physical characteristics, those kind of stuff. And their astrophotonics also plays a major role. Not only this, but if you go from uh, the spacecraft perspective, where you have a payloads which needs to, you know, uh, measure some kind of uh, spectrometry or interferometry uh, in a space, so they also played a major role over there. And with that, we can go for a precise analysis. Now, as as we look from uh, the astronomy perspective, so let me give a brief. You know the overview of astronomy. I believe we must know all those things astronomy. But to go further with the discussion, this is something base I have to set up further. So now, when we go for astronomy kind of stuff, right? There are three kind of categories that we you know separate out in the astronomy part. One is the optical astronomy, where you have a huge telescope, right? You can have a you have a mirror, either convex or a concave shape, 
and you are setting up your telescope and trying to you know explore the stars and the planets over there so this is the most common rate of astronomy that any amateur can do or in a professional can do over there then the radio astronomy is one where you are trying to get the radio waves and try to analyze them right and there are certain different centers across the globe who does this job then there is a x-ray astronomy where you go just above the atmosphere level and try to get x-rays from the space right so that is another class of astronomy that again the uh, it falls into the radio part but we do consider it as a separate as there is some other needs for doing such kind of astronomy and very interesting is something called as a gravitational wave astronomy so we'll see that detail one by one first so these are kind of the visible uh, or optical astronomy where uh, you can see their different you know locations or uh, across the globe like hanley the hawaii those kind of things where you have a huge centers and you are basically having the huge uh, few meters of the diameters of a telescope capturing the uh, you know the signal not the signals the basically visible patterns uh, of the galaxies or the stars over there so this is the uh, vis uh, what we call as a optical or a visible astronomy right and then we have these radio astronomy so this picture is from the giant vitter radio telescope located in india and they are trying to get the radio frequency data from the uh, space and try to analyze so generally you basically get kind of a 12 giga uh, gbps data per second this is something like speed that we they have the data and you need kind of the heavy processors to perform such kind of analysis over there so there are the radio frequency and those things starts coming into the picture design of an antenna and other signal processing aspect comes now this is something uh, that we can more relate now to the photonics part so uh, as you can see this particular picture uh, this is from the ligo observatory ligo stands for light interferometry gravitational wave observatory it is basically one of the location is in hanford and as you can see uh, the range in which this is has been you know expanded is kind of like more than 5 to 10 kilometers i believe so and now the question comes is like what are these pipe like structures and what does they mean over here the whole purpose of this particular observatory is to find out the gravitation waves and they could success they actually they were successful for on i think 15th of september 2015 i believe so where uh, they had actually detected the first gravitational wave uh, and they actually started doing a lot of analysis on that so let's understand the concept and how the photonics actually or the light or optical properties are related to this particular uh, kind of a ligo observatory over there and that will be set up our base for the astrophotonics part so as you can see there are two images on the top we have some image with something called as a space time curvature so in astronomy as per the einstein's theory as to the he says that he said that okay you have a space and a time curvature so time cannot exist exist without space and vice versa so what does this particular image says is that okay let's say you have a kind of a bed sheet right you hold the four corners of your bed sheet tight it tight enough and put some heavy object over here and basically that fabric of your bed sheet will start curving and this is what same thing happens in our universe where you have a uh, huge masses across the universe they are actually curving the space across us so we cannot feel that but eventually we as a human body also uh, with as per our mass and those things we are actually curving the space around us and this is what the space time curvature is spoken around uh, by the einstein heavier the mass heavier is the curvature so from earth perspective the sun will have the higher curvature of the space right if you go to to the black hole it's very heavy right? and this is what these uh, ligo observatory trying to uh, capture like the first they captured is about the gravitational waves which are generated from the space time curvature so unlike the optical signals or unlike the electromagnetic signals 
these are the different level of vibrations or different level of what we call as the waves which are basically generated from the distortion in space and time so the black holes who are basically colliding with each other curve the space and time heavily and the signal or the waves that has been you know distorting this space and time where when when they captured over there possibly there are few million years back uh, and distorted the space and time curvature so now how does the photonics plays the role in detecting these kind of stuff so so just if you go back over here and just uh, look at this shape again and coming back over here this is what the schematic for that uh, particular shape is right so there you will see there are two different arms right and there is a source of a laser at one point of time and there is a mirror over there right so the laser is there there is a mirror and there is a photo detector right so on both side we have this mirror at a right angle over there now from a perspective of laser right we have a continuous laser pointing to that particular mirror and eventually in between we have something called as a beam splitter it splits that particular light into this 90 degree of the phase shift over there now once you have this particular shift right the arms right so the light storage arms that mentioned over here they are basically kind of the sensitive to the movement of the gravitational wave and how do we detect it so as you can uh, see from this particular image that let us say if there is a kind of uh, gravitational wave that is hitting this particular uh, center over there right so the higher the gravitational wave higher will be the movement of this particular light storage arm of course the it is not going to move like a uh, few of the inches but even the slightest or uh, distortion in space time can be detected and few mm's or the few even few cm's uh, same as more but few mm's of this particular motion of this particular arm can be detected by this photo detector the reason being because we have the beam splitter and that something called as a split of this particular light can be detected by the photo detector and they have that sophisticated level of the instruments to detect such kind of moments over there so this way the laser source is basically trying to help to achieve the finding of the gravitational wave uh, if someone is interested in this ligo project you can actually go and uh, ligo observatory website they have a huge amount of data Uh, per year or a few months quarterly i think they started releasing now a data you have a lot of options of doing a lot of signal processing and doing data analysis on those uh, data as well so this is the foundations where you can see the use of the uh, what we call as the photonics part into the astronomy part right so this is one application of a uh, astrophotonics but our discussion is on much deeper level where we'll try to focus on the small photonics integrated circuits and how they are useful in the astronomical applications okay. now what is the thing that we are achieving through the astrophotonics right so some of the things that we look for is like uh, the major application that at is you can find uh, for this uh, app, uh, this uh, space or astronomical part is something was a interferometry which is kind of similar thing what we had discussed here right kind of because here what is happening is we have the splitting of that particular beam and then try to have a interferometer at one side right then we have something called as a spectrometry right and what what we mean by spectrometry is like uh, let us say if you focus on some of the bands of uh, the optical part so ultraviolet band is there we have a infrared band again we have a near infrared band in between the sub band over there and the visible band so now eventually let's uh, suppose that you are seeing some galaxy resources across a particular uh, part of the uh, the globe and you are trying to understand okay there are i can see two galaxy sources from the distance and i want to find out whether they are moving away to away from each other or they are coming closer to each other so how how do we uh, uh, understand that how what is the motion over there right so of course we have that particular what we call as the doppler effect and how do we try to measure that is whenever the optically we are taking the spectrum of that through the telescopes and if the two galaxies or the any two sources in the space are moving away from each other 
in a spectrum you will see kind of a red shift over there so it shows that the they are moving away from each other and on other hand if they are moving close to each other you will see kind of a blue shift in the spectrum that you have collected over there and that's what we call as a spectrometry or spectrophotometry for that matter then we also look for something called as a micro lensing where there is a huge curvature across the galaxies and you will see the light has been curved and you can see as a lens effect over there so for these are the different techniques in astronomy where you use the astrophotonics techniques now of course like the instruments that have been there for astrophotonics right so they have actually coming from a different telescope increasing like so we had a galilean telescope we had a newtonian telescope we still use that right so uh, with uh, the curvature and doing some things on a mirror you can you create your own newtonian telescope right and then uh, you had a different uh, spectroscopes and those things available in the market but this is like now almost uh, end of the era now right so now what interested is like we have a huge amount of data and we need to find out okay let us say i want to decide what is the actual source of a particular galaxy how i can locate over there when i can see that and to find more detail into that right so there i need to have a photonics emission of that particular galaxy i try to capture that as well now how we infer something that is happening right? so as i spoke about the red shift and the blue shift because of the kinematics of the galaxy that is something we try to observe right and what what we trying to understand from uh, those kind of uh, spectrums or uh, the data that we have collected from those astronomical detections right so uh, there is also one uh, section like uh, there are certain sources in the universe which are the faint sources meaning uh, you cannot find them through observational astronomy or through uh, the optical astronomy uh, if you like uh, go to the uh, constellation what you call as a scorpion beside that you have a kind of a near infrared spectrum which is not actually visible easily over there and there was a lot of research that has happened to find that particular source which was not there right so these are some of the sources which you cannot find out through radio telescopy or a, a visible telescopy you can use the astrophotonics and that scenario not only this because uh, we also can you know go for you know understanding the exoplanet and their astro uh, what you call as atmosphere across that and uh, another thing which is like kind of a high uh, you know the famous topic in this astrophotonics is understanding this near infrared spectrum right where you have at the uh, the the oh background so that basically you know uh, creates kind of uh, the faint sources right uh in that particular region of a galaxy so uh, you can consider that j band and h band with this particular mentioned what you call as a wavelength in the near infrared region which is not easily captured by uh, the visible or other kind of uh, telescopes that is available uh, across the globe and for that thing we need to add a special near infrared spectrum uh, to analyze that particular sources over there now looking from the challenges that we can uh, go and doing the astrophotonics right so of course like we have a huge amount of telescopes right uh, the satellites those things right so these are the large instruments that are already there right there are multiple bands so as i spoke about the infrared near infrared visible ultraviolet those kind of bands and for that thing your design considerations are totally different for different bands over there not only this because for the different bands you are looking for the different sources and uh, the different inference from those sources so we need a kind of a, a sophisticated design for these kind of multiple bands over there then also there is uh, i just mistaken for the inference right so basically interference so there are different interference uh, coming across over there and how we resolve that particular stops over there then the power consumptions of course the heavy telescopes and those things that we are trying to do that it has a heavy amount of consumptions and the cost is uh, you must be knowing the space missions the cost is huge in that scenario right so how does the photonics integrated circuit will help in that scenario right so first let's let's be uh, on the same page of the basics of the photonics where you have a dual nature of your light right the particle and the wave nature and we try to uh, you know use some materials in the uh, photonics uh, uh, basically integrated circuit to basically manipulate the light whether it's a 
reception, whether it's an emission, a detection, or you're processing some kind of optics, right? Uh, right. So there we have to design some circuitry in a photonics level, right? So think from a perspective that now we'll be discussing about the different circuitry instead of the uh, RLC circuit that we have electronics, we have some different components coming uh, across our way. So the photonics integrated circuit popularly use this silicon as their base, what you call a silicon photonics. And the cost and those things in a multiple, it's a much reduced compared to the huge uh, amount of the design that you make for the telescope. So these generally are kind of, uh, you know, the uh, kind of what you call as uh, the complementary for the, uh, uh, for what you call as a telescope, where uh, it supports the telescope in some of the operations for detecting few of the bands of the things. Now coming to now uh, the design part of uh, the silicon photonics, where you have kind of the wafer. So now uh, as this looks bigger, the wafer size generally goes uh, around like a uh, few of mm's actually, right? Few of a uh, few of mm's, right? But here you can see this is kind of a silicon substrate of 700 microns, and you have over there the buried oxide over there, and the silicon insulator with 220 nanometer. So this is the standard thickness that we use for a SOI, right? Silicon insulation. So consider this as like a, your fiber optic cable where you have a cladding and the core part over there. And that will serve your purpose for the photonic circuits. Now, the photonic circuits are uh, like, unlike uh, what you call, unlike your electronic circuits, the components in the photonics are quite different, right? So you can see this particular list where we have the waveguides, the Y branch, we'll be showing those images in the next slide. And uh, there are for like the Y branch, there is a laser and a photo detector because as we know, like we have in the electron circuit, we have a load and we have the source as a voltage, the laser and the photo detector are like the source and it, uh, you know, the end, uh, what you call as a load for entire of the photonics chips over there. And those, the wires that you consider where you are sending uh, the signal or the tracks on your PCBs are nothing but your waveguides. Now you have different kind of other components that we'll look in the moment. So when we come to the waveguides on uh, the photonic circuits, right? So this photonics integrated circuits are into some uh, micrometer range. So what I had initially worked in the range of 640 cross 400, uh, 410 microns, like length and height I'm speaking about. So here, there are two types of the waveguides, right? One is a strip waveguide and another rib waveguide. So you can see the strip waveguides are, uh, this is kind of a fabrication image that uh, they are generated. And uh, here you can observe that the strip waveguide, how it is carrying basically the light over there, right? So it has the property of carrying the light from a source and then navigating to the respective circuitry or to final to the photodetector part. So there is a one rib waveguide and a strip waveguide. So the rib is uh, needed because uh, the rib has basically a kind of a tapered structure. And this is much needed if uh, we want to have a design from a perspective of the interferometer or for that matter, uh, some of the spectrophotometers over there. Another thing over here is like the losses are uh, uh, less in the rib waveguide and we have a higher uh, kind of uh, losses in the strip waveguide. But considering the fact the size over there, the strip waveguide has the you know smaller size compared to the rib part. Right? So depending on your use case and the application, the designer will choose which one is better. Then what are the particular waveguide parameters that we'll look for? So basically, we try to look for more from a refractive index perspective because now this is more kind of a uh, cladding at a core part for fiber optic kind of stuff, but this is more happening on the chip level. So here, the importance is the index of the refractive index associated with that. So it's an effective index and a group index. So this effective index or the waveguide functionality is more dependent on the wavelength on which you are working. And as you consider the wavelength, it also depends on the temperature uh, and the material that you are using over there. So Generally, uh, based on the refractive index, the temperature at which you're working and the uh, type of waveguide, we are actually using these particular parameters. With a group index, 
uh, we can actually see the num the particular delay for particular uh, uh, band. So, for example, the red band has the higher group delay compared to uh, the uh, RGB, the blue band over there, right? So, depending on the wavelength, you have a different group index, and accordingly, you choose what waveguide is suitable for you in that moment. Then, what we have is uh, okay. So, I just okay. okay. So now the next parameter or the next component is called as a Y branch, right? So let me just first go over here. So you can see this particular Y branch. This is nothing but the kind of a splitter that you have. And each part over here is nothing but a waveguide. So here what happens is like you have this particular waveguide. At the moment, this waveguide is a basically a strip waveguide. And you are trying to create a Y branch for splitting up that particular uh, photons part over there, right? So this is more important in terms of the interferometers. Now, uh, since because of uh, this particular nature, so consider for the fact as a mirror image and connect these uh, two points over there, you will see like two Y branches connecting to each other. And one is creating a constructive interference and one is creating a destructive interference. Right? And that is what the principle of the Y branch is. right? And uh, once you have this particular uh, constructive or distant interference, of course, the fundamental again comes to the waveguide, what type of waveguide using in a design path. Right? So this is the, again, fundamental component for an uh, photonics path. Coming to other section where um, uh, the gratings part, or this also called as a grating couplers, right? Why we need it? So first of all, when we are trying to uh, have a light source uh, from a laser or any of the light sources we have, we are interested in you know separating out some of the bands from that and eventually this is similar to your prism where you are separating the sources of a light now there are certain active components and there are certain passive components now consider for the fact that if i have an active component i will use the light source like laser as a light source now but looking from an astrophotonics perspective when i'm looking uh, at as a part of a astronomical solution I have kind of a majority part as a uh, what we call as a passive components because I am getting the light source from the space itself, right? And that particular light source I need to divide into different spectrums. And for that thing, we have this particular kind of a grating structure. So what it has is like the height of this and uh, the complete uh, sorry the uh, height of this, the complete length of your grating, as well as this this is called as a period of grating. So what is the length? Uh, of that right so it's called the period of a grating so here if you observe on on the chip level how it has been fabricated so you can see this kind of structure as a uh, grating coupler on the slab waveguide itself right so it basically has kind of a 80 nanometer uh, width over there so this uh, this complete width is only 80 nanometer and there is certain period of that right at which uh, you are uh, separating out those kind of uh, uh, spectrums over there so this is the grating coupler. Uh, so this is responsible for uh, basically uh, separating out this uh, frequency part or not frequency, the wavelength part over there. And uh, the fundamentally, uh, it, what is happening is like throughout this particular material, when you design, the refract index uh, is basically has been varied over there. And because of this variation in the refractive index, you are getting a different scattering of that particular wave light. Now, Coming to the photonic circuits, right, where you have a uh, different circuits like interferometer or a ring resonator or a directional coupler. So when we say interferometer, so this is nothing but a simple Max Zender interferometer. So what it doing is like, so you just cut it into half, you'll see this is particular a simple Y branch at one point, and this is again a Y branch at one point. Now, what is happening is like I have a light source at this particular point entering into this waveguide. And since now I have this particular splitter, right, here my light is split. And now if you look from the face perspective, what is happening is like at the top, you have a smaller length compared to the bottom one. So eventually at the other Y branch over here, which is like the uh, left side, we have a splitter. At other side, we have a combiner part, right? So here what is happening is like they are basically uh, combining with the delayed phase shift, like right? so, phase shift has been uh, sh uh, delayed over here, and based on this particular thing, 
we will have some of the constructive and the destructive patterns and those patterns will be helpful for finding out some of the sources from astronomy so think from a perspective that you are observing some galaxy structure over there and you are trying to understand exact source so for example you are at particular latitude longitude and you are observing that thing right so uh, let it uh, make it more easy that let's say you are seeing some source of a light okay and you are basically closing your one, one eye and you are seeing that particular light source right so let's say your left eye is open you're closing the right eye you will see that in a different angle right and if you do the reverse where you have now uh, your right eye open and the left one closed you will see that in a different angle right so now to solve that particular problem exactly where the location is this particular guy helps to find out the right kind of in constructive and destructive pattern to locate exactly where the that particular object will be right so this is one of the application where uh, we can uh, use this interferometer now other part is about the spectrometer. So as I said that we are interested in going and finding out the spectrums of the particular uh, band and try to understand or infer that, okay, what could be happening at the background, whether you have the high H OS concentration or which band is uh, more dominating over there. And once you have that particular data, the astro uh, astrophysics guy takes this particular data and understand, okay, this might be the astrophysical property. So for example, you have uh, the uh, end of the life of that particular galaxy, right? So that time you see a lot of red spectrum band and you can predict, okay, this possibly can be a white dwarf in a future. So this can, just the example I'm giving at the moment. So there are three different types of, you know, spectrophotometers or spectrometers that exist, something called as an array waveguide grating, meaning, so we had discussed about waveguide, we had discussed about the grating. Now, we design waveguides such a fashion that they're in a grating fashion, meaning they are basically separating out the different components of the wavelengths of the light resources that are coming from the space. Similarly, uh, the one who in the Fourier transform spectrometer. So this is again similar to your FFT, but this is more happening on a grating level. They are trying to separate out those frequencies over there. There is one more grating called as a photonic initial grating. So this is more complicated and uh, they do the grating in more circular way over there. Right? I don't have a nice picture of that. I would have uh, actually added uh, for the discussion over there. Right? So now looking from this astrophotonics perspective. So if you look at this particular design where you have the input fiber fade over there. And uh, when you go to the circuit part, right, you have this particular waveguide. Now, what you're doing is like you are splitting that. Uh, so this is basically an array waveguide, right? So it's a combination of array waveguide. And uh, actually, it's nothing but only the array with the different grating structures. And what they're doing is they're creating a different path differences as per their length over there. And at the output, what we're getting is for the different path differences, we are getting the different wavelengths. Now, as we are doing the spectrum uh, analysis over there, we are getting the different wavelengths of the visible or near infrared, whatever region that we are capturing over there. And we can actually see what type of the uh, galaxy that uh, you're looking for. So assuming that you are targeting the, uh, the movement of the galaxies, you are trying to analyze over there. This particular spectrum at the output can help you to understand whether the galaxies are moving apart or not from the redshift as itself. So this is the path difference that uh, can happen through this waveguide design, right? So uh, again, one more things where you have basically a telescope itself and the photonic chip is now basically getting integrated with this point of telescope. For that, we need something called as a photonic lattice. This is again, kind of the uh, single mode fibers where you support only one mode of the communication uh, through that particular thing. So one mode light of light only applicable to that particular fiber, right? And there we have this particular grating structure where we are trying to, you know, uh, get this particular spectrometer and trying to, you know, separate out the different frequencies as we discussed in the previous slide. So at the output, you can uh, either connect a camera or a CCD or a different photo detectors that is the depending on the use case and try to analyze what type of wavelength is there in a spectrum bit. Okay. So uh, another good example would be so separating out the uh, what we call as the uh, the spectrum from the planet and the combination of stars and the planets right so here if you observe uh, 
on the top end part this array view guides are acting as a spectrometer and we have to separate the sources using the interferometer right so with the interferometer what we can do is we'll separate out the sources associated with the planet and the star thus we have the null and anti null so null is basically the destructive anti null is a constructive interference right so accordingly we have interfacing with the single mode fiber either through micro lenses or whatever structure you have and then you capture the data through the telescopes and you are basically taking the spectrum of that so the, there are different things like so um, what things can be done from a astrophotonics perspective so uh, of course like uh, or the consideration that we need to do is like what type of gratings you are using what type of interference you are using what type of fiber optic you are using in a design as well as what type of area of the telescope that you are covering so so there are different uh, use cases or the challenges that you have from where you address these considerations from a design perspective of a chip. now going further if you are developing some uh, actual photonics chips right so what are the steps that you need to follow over there so first of all you design your uh, architecture right so uh, you have uh, the different structures over there you choose the components what you are going to use then you have certain tools for the simulations i'll be telling which tools are there and what are the other steps over there you perform some kind of simulations and you uh, the most critical part over here is the solver part the electromagnetic solver because these are the photonics chips as a whole we need to resolve that we have to uh, find out the effect of the electromagnetics uh, over there with the different solvers so uh, some of the tools support the fttd solvers some of the uh, tools support something called as a bpm beam uh, propagation methods and accordingly they solve that particular problem over there so the most of uh, the tools like from ansi and those things they are using the combination of uh, the fttd and other uh, mom um, or uh, what we call as the bpm method to solve that particular em uh, problems or the solvers part uh, from a computational electromagnetics view of the particular photonics chips once you have designed those things you have that particular gds right uh, so we can use that k k layout and those things over there and you send it the that particular for a fabrication right when you send it for fabrication uh, they will test it and find out the errors in that right and again you have to you know uh, retune your design as per uh, the suggestions uh, by those particular uh, facility and once you have that particular uh, data uh, available uh, there is a lot of data analysis need to be done from the manufactured chips over there right and then you send that part, uh, particular chip for a production part so these are the steps so in detail as you can see we have the different component models that we simulate so whether it's a passive or opti active right so generally laser and those things that comes into the active part then you have the ring resonators and those odd direction couplers that again falls in act, uh, uh, active part optical part the passive part has those wave guides we have photo detectors we have uh, the wire branches and the grating parts as well then you use the simulation part you create a physical layout and the verification part we have this lithography kind of stuffs where it does actually uh, checks whether this particular design that you have uh, created fits into the design uh, fits in onto the chip and what will be the output over there so this is what we call as a lithography simulation and we have certain design rule checks for that as well right? and once you have that you send that to the foundry uh, and you have the pdk for that as well right and uh, then you can uh, test the actual uh, what we call as the output from your chip and the data from over there right? so then then you can go for a production so if someone is interested in this particular domain yes uh, you have certain tools like ansys optivo these are all paid tools the ip case is something like uh, it's though it's open source but it's a paid tool nasca is something uh, is open source and uh, free tool which is now coming up uh, for open source community right of course they have still limitations uh, from a design perspective and some of the components perspective but still it is a good thing uh, other thing that one can look for the different electromagnetic solvers and how do they apply once you have designed a particular photonic chips what are different fabrication methods and how we can analyze that particular data that is collected from this particular chip right so uh, this is what is about the uh, basics of astrophotonics i hope that made some sense right let me know if you have any questions uh yeah sure then aditya here so i have a question 
Yes. Yeah. So regarding your uh, electromagnetic, uh, so okay. Before we get into the part of electromagnetic solvers, uh, uh, basically we are talking about a sensor interface uh, designed to the outside world. Correct. So mm -hmm. currently, PCF technology is also taking a good pace. If my guesswork is right. So can PCF technology be cross supplied uh, to whatever it is because anyway we are looking at light sources at one end and processing at the other end of things. Yeah. Uh, I just missed something. Can you please repeat the question? I missed something in. Yeah. So my question was, can we use some sort of uh, PCF for our uh, sensor and uh, the other end of the system can be your uh, PIC, photonic integrated circuit. Is that kind of arrangement also possible? Yes, 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 it is there. Yeah. So most of now sensors, like for example, accelerometers and those things uh, can also be done with the photonics part. Yes. Yeah. All right. And uh, coming down to EM solvers, yes. traditionally, FTTD versus MOM uh, accuracy and uh, training and uh, redesign time and compilation matters, right? In terms yes, of yes. EM. yes, yes. So, when doing uh, your current simulation in uh, MOM and when doing your current simulation and analysis in say FTDD, what kind of error uh, ranges uh, are we looking at? Because that matters a lot when we move down to those terahertz of frequencies. Okay. So uh, what happens is like when we are uh, looking from a perspective of a photonics chip, right, the FTDD has uh, quite a high efficiency, uh, uh, more than MOM. As well as there is one more thing as I spoken about the beam propagation method. Now, uh, over here, what happens uh, in terms of the solving that particular problem, we have this uh, EE mode and the TM mode over there, right? In, in, yeah, in that do, yeah. scenario, right? Yeah. Uh, in that particular thing, uh, whatever the designs that you consider uh, solving the TE mode, TM mode, the FTDD plays a, a more efficient way in solving that particular problem. So most of the tools that you have for the simulations, most of them support the FTDD part over there. And uh, MOM is like there are less tools uh, as from a, a perspective of uh, the solvers part. I believe that uh, one of the Optiview has those things. But again, it is kind of a low cost tools and very less people use that. But considering the uh, higher efficiency or when we go for the higher design or the consideration for the different or the sub bands, let's say uh, consider for the NIR band, like uh, we have a very less amount of bandwidth over there. And in that scenario, we try to go for a FTD uh, solution because you have a better, although it takes a lot of time for the computation part, I agree, but the amount of uh, solution that you get out of it is much more accurate. So basically, your breakpoint comes between the computation time versus the accuracy that you get in the computation. Yes, 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 yes. Trade off is there. Yes. All right. So I might have one more question. Uh, uh, okay. In terms of photonic integrated circuits, and basically, we're looking at a multi physics environment, correct? Wow, your temperature also plays an effect with your yes, uh, yes, lensing yes, effect. Yes, a yes. Palm solver would be more efficient in terms of gathering and uh, extracting those data when compared to an ANSYS solver, correct? Yes, yes. So, in terms of console solver versus an ANSYS solver? Uh, console, I don't think console is uh, for the optics part. So, we have ANSYS and uh, we have the different uh, tools like uh, IP keys over there. So, console part I don't see over there. So, uh, uh, in for the photonic circuits. All right. All right. Cool, Yasha. Then uh, I think that's what I have for questions. For yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yasha Dan Vivek, for your presentation. Right, thanks. And thank, thank you for taking the time to, to sure. give this here at our event. Sure. Thanks a lot. With that, we will close the event for today. Um, We'll make just a few quick concluding remarks and announcements. Uh, the next event that we'll be hosting will be in approximately three months. Uh, we try to maintain a cadence of about one event every three months. And so our next event will tentatively be at maybe the end of July or early August, uh, three months from now. So stay tuned for that. We'll make announcements on our website, on Twitter, on the USRP users mailing list and the Discuss GNU Radio mailing list, um, and also on Reddit. So stay tuned there uh, for announcements, uh, including uh, the agenda for the fourth event. And if you'd like to speak in the fourth event, please reach out to us. We're always looking for speakers from the community. 
Uh, so please uh, get in touch with us if you might be interested in giving a presentation. Uh, or if you even have announcements that you would like us to make at the beginning of the event, um, get in touch with us. The easiest way to do that is to join our Slack uh, workspace. Um, if you go to the SISDRUG website, there's a page uh, for contacting us. And on that page, you can find the way, uh, the link for joining the Slack workspace. And there you can chat in real time with, with us on the organizing committee. We can talk about anything that, that's on your mind, whether it's simply questions about the event or questions about some of the presentations, or if you're interested in presenting yourself or, or making some announcement. So please get in touch with us and uh, join that community. Um, and with that, I think that is all the announcements for today. And that concludes our event number four. I thank everybody for joining. This event ha has been recorded and will be posted on our website. Uh, and on YouTube um, as part of our archives. All of our episodes, um, ep uh, events one, two, and now event three are, are available to watch at any time on YouTube. And um, we'll hopefully see you on, on the fourth event. Uh, please keep in touch. Please reach out to any of us anytime. And we'll see you in a few months. Thank you very much.